Transmitting live here from Amman, Jordan, at the Farah Medical Campus. This is an old photo of the first hospital in Jordan. The entire hospital in Amman, Jordan, you can see they have chosen a remote place just outside Amman then to build this hospital. And this is a new picture of the hospital. Jordan is uh, considered as a medical hub in the area of the Middle East, and we are proud of the strides of advancements that we have made over the years. Uh, this is part two of the, in, uh, the topic that we started to discuss, that is radiation-induced tumors by radiation. I started last time to show you the risk of radiation in general, whether it is radiotherapy or radiosurgery. Uh, and I mentioned the, that the X-rays were uh, discovered by Rottingen, uh, and from then uh, the whole revolution started. Uh, I also mentioned the uh, 
disaster of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the 6th and 9th of August 45, which followed, was followed by lots of brain tumors in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki survivors. We also mentioned the use of radiotherapy for the tenia capitis of the head and how people developed uh, tumors. So in summary, radiation-induced neoplasm after conventional radiotherapy is well documented. Nobody can argue about that. It is well known fact. That does not mean that radiotherapy is evil. Radiotherapy is one tool that is used against cancer. So it's very useful, but it has to be used in a good sense and in good understanding. I also mentioned this Cahan, uh, William Cahan, 1948 from New York. He published this paper in the Cancer Journal about sarcoma arising in the irradiated bone in 11 cases. He irradiated bone in 11 cases for various reasons, which included then ankylosing spondylitis, TB, trauma, etc., and then discovered that 11 patients of his developed sarcoma. So he came up with the idea, why did these people develop tumors? So this must be the effect of radiation. And he proposed his uh, criteria for when do you consider that a tumor is secondary to radiation? He said, well, let's be specific. If somebody developed a tumor and you say this is due to radiation, the tumor should be arising in the, the same field. So if you radiate the shoulder, the tumor should be in the upper part of the body, not in the lower part, for example. Two, the tumor that you discovered was not there before. The histology of the two tumors, the one that was treated and the one that developed should be different. And there should be some time between the radiation and the tumor. And five, that the patient should not have genetic predisposition to secondary malignancies. And I mentioned to you all these review of literature, which is just the sum of the literature, not all of it, about the cases that followed radiation. So it is well established. Again, doesn't mean that radiation is evil. This is science. We have to mention this. If we get complications after surgery, it doesn't mean that surgery is bad. If a patient dies during surgery or gets hemiplegia during surgery, it doesn't mean that surgery is bad. If there are complications from radiation and radiotherapy related surgery, it doesn't mean these things are bad. But they are bad when they are put in the hands of the wrong people. So here you are, all these literature. I uh, discussed that last time. And it's put in the author of the year, what was the primary tumor, when it happens, and so on. And also the back to the tinea capitis thing that happened with the uh, Jewish people that were in the concentration camps. They were uh, in a very bad uh, cleaning situations or healthy situations. So they were, when they went back to Israel, uh, they were treated with, uh, with the infrared lamp. And later on, years later, they developed these tumors. And I said that also this, my observation I saw the same with the refugees of the Palestinians who were treated with the infrared for tinea capitis, and I saw them with huge tumors. And the thing about these tumors, when they develop after radiation, they are bad, they are ugly, extremely ugly, ugly in shape, in multiplicity, in histology, and in the way you treat them. So you have to be careful. Look at this very ugly tubes. And the skin here is paper thin. I remember one case I've done here in Jordan, a Palestinian who was a kid as a refugee in the camps and he developed me in Germany. I could not find the skin to suture it actually. And as I said that the tumors that develop, like in Germany, for example, and this is mentioned in, uh, in uh, Osama al Mufti book, Meningiomas that they have lots of necrosis, ATB, and vascular proliferation. So the histologically they are bad, either grade two or grade three, never grade one. Examples in Sam and Mufti book about how aggressive they are, these tumors after radiation. He excites them 
they come back, he excites them, they come back, they just came back. And this is one of the giants of the giants of skull based surgery in the world. And also he mentioned the multiplicity of these meningiomas. When they come, they come in multiple uh, forms. What about radiosurgery? If radiotherapy causes tumors, why not radiosurgery? I also discussed last time that the people who use gamma, and I'm, I'm one of them, uh, they consider that well. Radiation by radiotherapy carries higher risk than uh, radiosurgery. Why? Because they said, well, we use a small dose. So one, two grays will not do, the, will not do any damage. The answer is no. Those people who received treatment for tinea capitis, it was less than one gray, yet they developed tumors. So radio surgery can induce tumors. They said, well, let's not use the word induced. Let's use the word associated. It's just the same. Induced or associated, it is just the same. It is related to radiation. Again, does not mean that radio surgery is evil. It means if it is in the wrong hands, it is evil. Let me take you into this statement by Lexell. Lexell is the Swedish neurosurgeon who in 1970 discovered the gamma knife and the stereotactic frame. And he started producing this uh, prototype machine of gamma knife. And he said, this is the delivery of a single high dose, single because he wanted to differentiate it from radiotherapy. Radiotherapy, you get uh, 45, 50 grays over six weeks or whatever. This is one single dose, 50 gray, 80 gray, 90 grays. High dose, single, to what? To a small and critically located intracranial tube, small, deeply situated not a meningioma here on the surface. These are the bad hands, the evil hands that use the gamma knife. This is myself, having brought the first gamma machine to Jordan. And this was the first machine in the Middle East. I think we were country number 13 in the world to acquire this. Why did I, why did I go there? Because this is an advancement. It's good to have the gamma knife. It's uh, the tool against the disease, but it is the way you use it. And I keep saying, a fool with a tool is still a fool. It is a tool. And I consider this as an advancement and I went there. I spent six months in uh, Karolinska, Sweden. And this is myself during training. And here also I learned how to ski. But this is a fake picture. Yeah. This is the first time I put my feet in this thing and I did not know what to do. And the man tells, I said, what to do? He said, you just do this and it will go. So I did this and I went. I could not tell what, what to do. In the whole field here, there is a long, lonely tree. And I just went into it. Uh, Stockholm. Uh, this is outside Stockholm. This is the skiing resort. So I spent six months uh, to gain how to use the gamma. It took you one week. It's nothing. <coughs> but I wanted to stay there to see how they choose their cases. They have a committee made of 25 people sitting there every week to receive the cases from all over the world and then decide which case to use it. So I understood how they select the cases. The evil hands, it is just one person who's deciding everything and he decided the indications. This is evil for the, for the gamma knife. And this is my certificate. It says, I stayed there from November 95 to May 96, full six months attending the indications, attending the follow-ups and so on and so forth. And I remember when I was there, a case was referred from Jordan. It was a glioma, it was not indicated. So the committee decided we will not to treat it, send it back to Jordan. I said, maybe it will affect our decision to buy the machine. I said, we don't care. This is not to be treated with gamma knives. So to me, when I went there and I came back, 
with the experience. To me, according to Lars Laxell, the inventor, it is a tool used for difficult cases that are deeply situated, which we cannot reach by surgery. In elderly patients with major concomitant diseases like diabetes or heart disease, or there is recurrent disease after surgery, and there's this loose indication when patients refuse surgery. Again, in the band, bad hands, this is what they say. Uh, the patient refuses surgery. The patient refuses surgery if you make surgery evil. If you say, if you go for surgery, they will open your heads for 10 hours. You'll go to the ICU, you may die, you may get paraplegia, hemiplegia, etc. But if we do radiation, the tumor will evaporate. No anesthesia. You come in the morning, you live in the afternoon. So it's worth it. Shall I open your head with an X or do you, would you rather have one session? Of Absolutely. And then you go home and they tell the. the <laughs> to to have of, course, of course. So when you look at the. How can we tell that radio surgery causes tumors? It is impossible to make an accurate assessment of the magnitude of radio surgery induced tumors. Why? Because all the papers, all of them, short follow. -up. And we said that after radiation, you need about five, seven, 10, 15, 20, 30 years for the malignancy to, or for the tumor to develop. So it is always short follow up, it's always under reporting, is under estimation. Because you just want to publicize the you know, use. So they treat 50 patients within three years, they produce a paper. So no, no, side effects, no, complications. no complications. The follow up is great and no malignancy, no tumors. I will mention some of the papers with and against. Pacer is a user of the, he's an oncologist. Uh, he produced this in the British Journal of Cancer. Will come from Russia. He just came from Russia. I thought he should have been some eyes for him. He didn't. So Pacer published this in the Journal of Cancer. And he looked at the neurofibromatosis, radio surgery, and malignant tumors. And he said, 5% of these patients who had uh, radio surgery, they developed malignant, trans uh, malignant change or transformation of the uh, This is one voice from the Gamma Knife group. Rui from Sheffield from England. Again, it was, I think, the second uh, radio surgery machine in the world after Karolinska. The third was in Argentina, and the fifth was in uh, Pittsburgh. So Rui published this 2003. He treated 122 vertebral schwannoma, and he put eight years of follow-up. And he said, no problem. Gamma enough is valuable treatment. No problem whatsoever. Rui again, 2007, from Sheffield, published in Neuro-Oncology. The title was Safety of Radio Surgery in NF2 Patients, 116 vertebral schwannoma, two developed molecular transformation. So these are the people who use the gamma who are the initial centers in the world. They tell you they had malignancy. It is not my, it is not spare speculations. These are centers, these are publications. And I'm just putting it in front of you. Birkhead, 2012. We looked at the results of gamma knife in NF2 patients. Remember that our two cases are NF2. That's why I'm concentrating on NF2. He said 15 patients, all meningiomas, no secondary tumors, no malignant transformation. So gamma knife is effective treatment. Another paper from France, from John Regis, from Marseille, France. Again, a major center in the world for, for gamma radio surgery. All is well. Uh, control is 95, 98%, no malignancy is nothing. And then came a voice of warning. The risk of radio surgery, gentlemen, ladies, listen, the risk of radio surgery induced tumors may be higher than previously reported. So be careful. These people may not be publishing the right uh, numbers. And then there was the flooding tsunami of papers mentioning this. Glioblastoma after stereotactic radiotherapy for acoustic neuroma. So they operated in here. 
This is the histology, benign schwannoma. It recurred again. They, they, they gave, gave her a gamma knife and they developed uh, Leibniston multiform. So this is histologically proven. Histology proven that the thing that was treated was benign vestibular schwannoma. Back, benign vestibular schwannoma histology. And then JBM. How can anybody say this is not correct? This is absolutely correct. Uh, this paper about, again, malignant transformation of benign schwannomas into malignant ones, Japan, 2010. Again, they put the histology. Do we have histology before? Yes, prior surgery, we have benign schwannoma, benign schwannoma, and then they turn into malignant. So nobody can say, well, we don't know what was the original pathology. Maybe it was malignant from the start. We say, well, these people, they knew the histology before. So it was established. So surgery, schwannoma, giving gamma knife, seven and a half years later, malignant schwannoma. Can you argue with this? No. Malignancy in vestibular phenomena after stereotactic radiotherapy from one of the giants of skull base surgery, the neurotologist Mario Sana. Uh, nine patients all received this surgery, all terminal implant, all. This is not my paper. This is one of the giants of skull base surgery. 2011, Schmidt, again, he's a neuro oncologist from Mayo Clinic. Radiation induced sarcoma and schwannoma. There it is. Seven months, not five years, according to Kahan. Again, from South Korea, 2015, radiation accused osteosarcoma after schwannoma. Histologically proven. The list goes on, on. temporal lobe glioic sarcoma, like a brooch, my clinic. Look at this. Japan, 2005, malignant progression of benign tumors after being given gamma knife. The question is, is it really caused by radiation? The answer is yes. They have put the primary histology and they have put the malignancy. Again, the histology before, the histology after. So proven histology, it was benign and it tend to be malignant. It's not my paper. Another histology confirmed before? Yes, yes, yes. Malignancy later. Malignant transformation, vestibular schwannoma after gamma knife. Gamma knife, malignant histology. Progression from benign into malignant. Barry from Cambridge. Lists of the uh, authors. And I have put a circle around the time that lapsed between the primary treatment and then the development of a secondary tumor. Look at this, 7.5, 17 years, 19 years, 16 years. That's the time it takes. So all those people who were treated from the year 2000, we don't know anything about them, but the flood is coming. Soon there will be tsunami of cases with these tumors, but the denial continues. Again, authors, we are now year 2000, year 10. Look at this, eight years. Here is eight months. This patient died within eight months. 20 years or 10 years, 10 years, 13 years. Anybody can take it, his camera and take a shot of this and you can go into literature and find that what I'm telling you is the truth. The international audience can register this, they record this. They can go to the literature and find that every word on this slide is true. It's not, I just collected the data, it's there. 2010, 2018, 25 years, yeah, 25 years, 18, 19. So this is the most recent, this is the most recent publication. So the rest can go on. Histology, the malignancy, again, histology, the malignancy. 
So nobody can say that this is by accusation against Yama. I respect Yama. I think it's a very useful tool, but it has to be used in a good sense, in a scientific sense. Not to be used because I'm a mediocre surgeon, I treat everything with gamma knife. Not to treat everybody that I lie to people and say that this tumor is going to evaporate and you can go home in two hours and take your kids to the cinema. These are people that are using the gamma knife, Stark and Sheehan from Charlottesville, Virginia. The risk of radiation induced neoplasm after radio surgery may not be markedly different from radiotherapy. So just the same. Radio surgery and radiotherapy carries the same risk. The only thing that radio surgery it takes a longer period of time than radiotherapy. Remember that this is the accepted risk of malignancy. Again, does not mean that radiotherapy and radio surgery are evil. The evil are the people who are using it in a wrong sense of the word. Not only malignancy, but also that if you want to operate on a patient who had radio surgery, it's 100 times difficult. Now I'm speaking from terms of experience. I have seen and I have operated on patients after they have received gamma life, and it is a hell of a job to do. But don't take my word for it. Schudler, 99. Schutto, 2008. Flattery, again, the same period. What did they say? <coughs> Macrosurgery is complicated by post-radiation changes. But who is the most man you respect in vestibular shamana? Majid Sam. Yes. He has done 5,000 cases. He is the world expert on vestibular shamana. What does he say? Don't take my word for it. Take this man's word for it. This is published in the World of Neurosurgery, in which I am at an uh, advisory board of the of the uh, journal. He says, this is a statement, gamma knife stereotactic radiation in neurofibromatosis, vestibular phenomena, is associated with poorer results than in sporadic ones. Continues, surgery after the previous radio surgery is most challenging related to worse outcome in all the surgeries after radio surgery. All his cases, and he has done, as I said, 5,000 cases of schwannomas, among them, I don't know how many hundreds of NF2 after radio surgery, all of them were difficult. Don't believe me, believe him. And this is the article, surgical treatment of patients with vestibular schwannoma after failed previous radio surgery. They failed. And this is Sammy and his assistant Gregory. And here is his results. Very obvious. In our series, that's Majid Sami. In our series, all surgeries, all after failed radio surgery were more difficult. Why? You don't see the structures, you don't see the nerve, you don't see the artery, they are all the same color. You don't see brain stem, it's the same color like the tumor. And I will show you this and the cases I'm going to present. There is arachnoid scarring, so there is no plane of cleavage. If you just touch the nerve, the nerve may tear. It's more sensitive to surgical maneuvers. Blood vessels are fragile. So after this introduction, we'll just present these two cases. Radiation-induced tumors in two cases of mine. And who treated them with gamma? Myself. So nobody can claim that I'm accusing anybody of doing wrong. I'm talking about cases and we discovered this finding, so I'm presenting it to you. So what is NF2? Neurofibromatosis. It is an autosomal <coughs> dominant disease predisposing patients to multiple tumors. If you have this disease, uh, this is, you are genetically destined to have tumors. So that's why it's called the neurofibromatosis. Two types, type one, is older than the type two, one Rittenhausen disease, uh, discovered before type two. <coughs> this is the commonest, 90% of patients. Here is about 10% of patients. And F1 chromosome 17 is 40, and F2 chromosome 22. List of differences between NF1 and NF2. And incidence, incidence in, in NF1 is more than in NF2. Age of onset here, younger age here, 
middle age. There are eye changes, the skin changes more in NF1, which is the cafe au lait. Okay. But still you can have cafe au lait, but it's much less. Eye manifestations are more in NF1, cataract and everything. Bony abnormalities are present, not present. And of course, the tumors here are peripheral, tumors here are central. So these are the kind of tumors that you develop in NF2. The commonest is vestibular schwannoma. And if you see bilateral vestibular schwannoma, 100% you are dealing with neurofibromatosis. But other tumors can happen, like other schwannomas, trigeminal schwannoma, abusant, etc. Bindemomas, meningiomas, and spinal tumors. So vestibular schwannoma is present in 90% of patients. Meningioma is present in 50%, spinal is present in 90%. What is the long term of this? How they do they live or not? And what is the rate of growth? Again, somebody took the trammel, uh, Dirks, to look at the long term, and he says, listen, they don't grow like this. They grow, they stop, they grow, they stop. So we have to be careful like this. What is the mean age of death? Mean is 36 years. They are gonna succumb and die because of their intracranial tumors. So the best thing is that you don't operate and jump on each tumor. You just jump and operate on tumors that are progressively symptomatic or progressively increasing in size. Uh, with this, I will stop and ask Dr. Faraz Awaisha to tell us more about neurofibromatosis and the relationship to anesthesia, Faraz. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Firas Awaishi. I'm an anesthesiologist at Farah Medical Campus. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahim, for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about anesthesia for neurofibromatosis, as this is a very special topic. And uh, it comes as a special night because I'm presenting this in front of my master and my teacher, Dr. Mahali Adami. Welcome aboard. Uh, so uh, we hope that we will have some of his inputs on this topic as well. Uh, just as an introduction, uh, the neurofibromatosis is a, a spectrum of diseases as it comes a group of diseases, and it's hereditary, hereditary diseases transmitted in an autosomal dominant fashion. They are characterized by the formation of tumors of ectodermal and mesodermal tissues, which means it can happen anywhere in the body. Um, uh, as well, and can therefore, as we said, involve any organ in the body, not only the brain. Uh, they belong to a group of uh, neurocutaneous syndromes, or uh, in other terms, it's called phocomatosis, which includes tuberous sclerosis, ataxia, ataxia telangiectasia, uh, Sterk Weber syndrome, von Hippel Lindau diseases, and these are extremely rare diseases. But what if uh, we are faced? with these patients and we are bombarded with them all of a sudden. This is the message that I want to pass to my fellow uh, anesthetist, because I have been taught by my teacher, <laughs> Dr. Maali Ababni, most of the catastrophes uh, that we are faced uh, during anesthesia, they come at a time where you don't expect them. And these cases uh, are extremely important, not only because we face them during neuroanesthesia, because these patients might present for other surgeries, especially during pregnancy and during delivery. So what should we do when we are faced with these kinds of cases, even though they are extremely rare? So neurofibromatosis, as Dr. Brahim said, there are two types, type one and type two. Just in summary, type one is uh, peripheral and type two is the CNS involvement, which involves the cranial and spinal nerve sheath tumors. Other tumors found in neurofibromatosis one, uh, extremely important for anesthesiologists to know that this is, can be associated with fear chromocytoma and carcinoma tumors, especially if patients can present for bowel surgeries. Juvenile uh, chronic myeloid leukemia and other tumors of non-neurogenic origin such as thyroid carcinoma and melanoma. So what are the diagnostic criteria? So I'll be discussing the, the diagnostic criteria, when the, when the patients meet these criteria, for sure they would have uh, neurofibromatosis type one. So two or more of the following, six or more of the cafe or spots, two or more neurofib uh, neurofibromas of any type, 
optic glioma, two or more nodules benign uh, melanotic iris hematomas, a distinctive bony lesion, and a first degree relative. This is extremely important in case these patients are not diagnosed preoperatively. So it's gonna give you a clue if these patients have neurofibromatosis one. Now we're gonna talk about neurofibromatosis two, and these are presumed diagnosis of neurofibromatosis two. If you have a, a unilateral vestibular schwannoma as opposed to bilateral uh, uh, vestibular schwannoma, in case they have a bilateral vestibular schwannoma, then for sure they have neurofibromatosis two with the onset of less than 30 years or multiple meningiomas uh, and unilateral vestibular schwannoma with an onset of less than 30 years or one of the schwannoma glioma and juvenile posterior uh, subcapsular cataract. Yes. Now we come to the definite diagnosis of neurofibromatosis II, bilateral vestibular schwannomas, or a first degree relative with neurofibromatosis II, and either unilateral vestibular schwannoma with an onset of less than 30 years, or any two of the following, meningioma, glioma, schwannoma, and subcapsular cataract. So what are the anesthetic considerations for the neurofibromatosis in case we are faced with these uh, patients, not only for, as I said, uh, in neurosurgery, but uh, because most of the anesthesia uh, um, uh, literature on, the, on, the, uh, on this disease comes from either case reports or anecdotal teaching. And mainly uh, before 2001, uh, the classification was mainly neurofibromatosis one or von uh, lindo disease, and uh, sorry, von Recklinghausen disease. And then uh, now, nowadays we are talking about eight subtypes of this disease. Now, the first concern is a potential difficult airway, and this could be catastrophic. This is the, the most scary uh, 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 implication uh, uh, for this kind of disease because airway obstruction and distortion from the laryngeal and pharyngeal tongue and cervical tumors and microcephaly and microglossia in these patients. Um, another major concern that these tumors are extremely vascular. So bleeding could be of a major concern. Uh, uh, central nervous system concerns are increased ICP and plus minus contraindication to neural axial anesthesia. Uh, as uh, Dr. Brahim mentioned, when it comes to uh, gamma radiation, we talk about uh, regional anesthesia uh, in selected patients, visual anesthesia is fantastic if you know when and how to use it. But in these patients, if they have central nervous system tumors, it's absolute contraindication to use uh, 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 neuroaxial anesthesia, especially in pregnancy. Seizures disorders, cognitive deficits, and peripheral neuropathy. Um, they are extreme, they have an extremely unpredictable response to neuromuscular drugs. Uh, where they have variable responses uh, to uh, succinylcholine and non depolarizing muscle relaxants. Epidural and spinal may be contraindicated if uh, spinal neurofibroma is present, as we mentioned. Respiratory wise, we're talking about restrictive lung disease, and then uh, we have potential for pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, and right ventricular uh, failure, and mediastinal neurofibroma. Cardiovascular, they, uh, they come all, almost all with hypertension and usually it's essential unless we have fewer chromocytoma in less than 1% of the patients. Dysrhythmias, which can be idiopathic as well. Cardiomyopathy, which is an enemy for anesthesia. And mind you, a scary uh, complication is the right ventricular outflow tract uh, uh, tumor, which can cause right uh, ventricular outflow obstruction, which means if we are not aware of this, patients could die on induction. Uh, possible endocrine problems, as we said, fear chromocytoma is a major concern for uh, anesthesiologists. And thank you very much. I want to ask Dr. Mawia, what happens to the patient as an anesthetist if you are not aware that he has fear chromocytoma? Can you come here, please? Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Uh, but just to remind you, you remember that uh, guy with the, uh, we've done him, he has bilateral chromocytoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, we took his consent to me and we made a video of him. If you anesthetize any, any uh, patient with uh, one single chromocytoma, not bilateral, and you are not aware, most probably you will lose more. 
at the best chance, probably you'll end up paraplegic, hemiplegic, stroked, near the infiltrator three months, four months. This is his best chance. But definitely, probably, most probably, he will be there. But uh, just a minute, we'll go back to these NF2 patients. They are nightmares. And uh, he, he said, take on say, Thomas, he, said, he mentioned less than 1%. Sorry, but from my career, which we've seen, I would guess more than that, literally. By then, bilateral, okay, I've seen them, but that uh, 100% syndrome, if you remember, we made a video. Uh, we, he had bilateral. Fever, fever, chromocytomas, we've done two stages, and he was sheer nightmare every time because, as you mentioned, it was vascular with fever, chromocytoma with cardiomyopathy. I would guess it's always there, almost always, because of the disease itself. And I'm sure it affected because all of them they manifested table with signs and symptoms of cardiomyopathy, but uh, right into the uh, outflow obstruction was total. So these patients. Best thing when you see one in the list, take a leave and leave it from there. Honestly, <laughs> just going back to, to radiation as well from AL, uh, ATLS uh, book guideline. Uh, there is, as he, he mentioned, I mean, these are mode of treatment, they are scientific and they are there. And in the ATLS guidelines, there should be a CT scan and emergency room are part of ATLS guideline. But there's a big sign one in 1300 patients because of UC scan will develop cancer. So don't do it unless you really, really, and sorry to speak of the one of the experts of time, but this is an HLS book guidelines. One of 1,300 patients, you do CT scans, you will end up having this because of your CT scan. So it is a treatment, it's a, it is science, but a tool. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, again, if you are not careful and you anesthetize or operate on a patient with a thiochromocytoma, it's going to end with death. And you say, well, this is very rare. It may, I just send it to my eye, I'm going to tell you this story, which happened to me as a resident. I've just landed in, in London, 1980, as a resident. And one of the first cases I've seen, a man who came as an emergency with acute disc prolapse. I examined him quickly before the bus comes. I did not look into his genitalia, because in Jordan, it's not good. <laughs> and the boss said, uh, what about the weakness? Yes, he has weakness, dorsiflexion, flexion, ankle jerk is absent. And he said, Abraham, what about his urine? Is he in control? Mm -hmm. I did not look. So I said, yes, sir, I lied. And he just pulled the cover and the patient had indwelling catheter in situ, because he had urine retention. Uh, you know, I wish then that the, I would disappear from the surface of the earth because I thought, well, it would not happen in that particular case. It happens in that particular case when you are least suspecting it. And if two are rare, let me show you my series, and not all the series, just examples of which. 24-year-old female, look, look how much real stem is left. This is how bad this disease is. 35 year old male, look at this. These are neurofibromas. 11 year old, 11, look at this. Orbital tumor, and something here in the cavernous sinus, something here, petroclavial area, bilateral uh, vestibular. Look at this here, this is genoma of a trigeminal going into the infratemporal fossa, destroying the bone. It's a bad disease. 11 year old, and this is five years later. This is the same patient. This is a presentation and this is follow-up. Look at this. That's why you don't jump on any of these unless it is life-saving. You know in your heart that this patient is gonna develop tumors. So you'll not work like a woody woodpecker and jump on the patient and take a tumor every now and then because you need some money. Look at these tumors, schwannomas. This girl from uh, Mafrak, 17 year old female, look at this bilateral, look at these tumors. And in fact, she presented with this tumor 
and I operated upon her because she had the brain stem manifestations. I took this tumor out, but I left the others for observation. And then five years later, look at this. More tumors developing. And look at this. That when she was 26. Nothing you can do. Absolutely nothing. <coughs> A 16 year old male patient with these tumors, extensive spinal tumors, bilateral, stibular schwannomas, etc. 20 year old male patient, look at this. Look at this. What can you do to this patient? Gamma. 25 year old male patient. Again, with these tumors. So they are there. Stop using the uh, excuse. These are cases are rare. You will face them. And when you face them, patient is going to die because of your ignorance and illiteracy that you don't know about these cases. First case, 17-year-old female patient, Jordanian, presented with quadriparesis, hearing loss, tinnitus, anastatomies, negative family history. Pyramidal weakness, extensor plantar response, Hoffman, which means that she has upper motor neuron disease, sustained jerks, means that she has upper motor neuron disease, impaired cerebellar test on the left side. That's the patient, and that's the image. What do we have? Bilateral vestibular schwannoma, meningioma of the cavernous sinus, cortical meningioma, spinal tumors. What would you do? She had this. This was a foramen magnum tumor, and this was the cause of her quadriparesis. So I operated on this. Uh, of course, we got ENT consultation uh, by Dr. Mahmoud Asad. Do you want to come in, Mahmoud? This patient had a left sided uh, uh, hearing deafness. <laughs> yeah, it's really no, this is the right uh, uh, sensor neural hearing loss, mainly the high frequency and the low frequency and the middle are is okay. The other one is uh, no response. Okay. So I took the patient because she had the quadriparesis. For me, quadriparesis cannot be caused by these, cannot be caused by this, it has to be caused by this. So I went to the culprit and I operated upon this. This is just the still pictures. This is, we are doing it in the sitting position. This is the spinal cord, the dura, and here we're going into the posterior fossa on the uh, left side. And we are taking the tumor from the foramen magnum. Let's see the video. So the other patient is in sitting position. This is the dura, and we are extra dura. This is dura covering the spinal cord. You are going here into the posterior fossa. And this tumor is on the left side of the foramen magnum. It is totally extra dural meningioma. Extra dural meningioma, yes. Meningioma is that the foramen magnum could be extra dural and extra dural yes. combination. They could be above or at the level or below the level of the vertebral artery. They could be anterior or posterior to the uh, 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 neural tissue. So here we are moving with this too. Okay, I think it's enough. Okay. And that's the histology. Uh, it was done by Dr. Brahim Tillau. Brahim Tillau has left us a long time ago. He's now in, I think, Saudi Arabia. He's dead. He's dead. Died? I'm sorry. Um, but he, he described this as a meningioma. German of the extradural type. And because she had decreased hearing, uh, almost gone hearing on the left side, and her brainstem was compressed, so we gave, I gave, 
gamma radio surgery to her left vestibular schwannoma. If you have bilateral vestibular schwannomas, you go for the ear with the deaf, deaf ear or the worst hearing, because hearing is lost. So when you give gamma knife, you are not worried about that. So these are the details of the gamma knife. I told you I'm the expert on the gamma knife. This is the volume of the lesion, 12 grades to the 50 percentile of those. And histogram showed 95% of the tumor received uh, not blood based. Maybe you don't believe me. So I brought you the gamma knife plan. Uh, this is the patient. And uh, this is my name on it in the charts. And this is the details of the treatment. And uh, this is the left vestibular schwannoma being treated with gamma knife. You can see the isodosis around the tumor. Remember that. And uh, these are the details of the gamma knife. This is my signature there. And six months follow up. And there was a little bit of increase in the size with central necrosis. In the gamma and knife perceptions, there is usually increase in the size with central necrosis. So this is accepted. But then she was lost for follow up, lost completely. Came back four years later, she was drowsy, severe papilledema with left-sided weakness. And look at this. Remember she had bilateral acoustic, but what is this? Look at this, like a tree on top of it. This cannot be except caused by radiation because this is exactly what the isodoses of radiation are. Nobody can argue with this. And if two patients or not, can hand criteria or not, this is caused by radiation. I thought that this is the same tumor that the vestibular schwannoma grew in size. I was mistaken. Remind you of the isodosis. If this is the vestibular schwannoma, your isodosis is like this. This tumor, I'll go back, is exactly where the isodosis are. You agree? So what should you do? No breast, I'm left. So I went into surgery. Uh, this is, I asked my artist to draw uh, a drawing for this because most of the people outside, they have an artist. Why should not we have one? And I had one and I asked her, a good lady. And she said, well, this is the acoustic neuroma and this is the other tumor. So I went in, found this first tumor Difficult to dissect, but again, when I removed it, there is a tumor, another tumor there. And this is the internal detrimatus, which I drilled. I'm here in the internal detrimatus, and look at this tumor. So one tumor, second tumor. Let's see the video. The quality is not optimal, but but the message is there. This is the first tumor, which is the large one, which by the way, turned out to be an injury. So a new tumor has developed on the, on top of the first one, which is, look at this, no plane of cleavage. I'm trying my best to create a plane of cleavage. The surgery after radio surgery is hell of a difficult. So this is the tumor, the first tumor, the meningium. And this is the second tumor. <coughs> so still removing the first tumor. There's no way here that you preserve facial. With these adhesions, you can't. I'm drilling the internal detrimatus, and always when you drill, you drill the posterior rim and the superior rim. <coughs> of the internal detrimatus from here gouging what how length what is the length of the internal detrimatus and this is the usual way of knowing how much you drill so the internal detrimatus was here so we drilled all this here is the of course is the jugular you have to be aware that she doesn't have a high jugular bulb otherwise you would kill her so you drill the internal detrimatus so that you can see the tumor well so this is the internal detrimatus dilated by this tumor. So this is the tumor 
and this is the completion. Here there is a small nick of color of the dura, which I'm gonna cut so that I start doing. And then you follow the same rules of vestibular schwannoma. You debulk from inside and then you go around it. I use the ultrasonic aspirator for debulking and then start to go around. Again, lots of adhesions. You don't see nerves. The tumor and the brainstem and the nerves and the arteries are of the same color. So you want to save the important nerves. Here we have the vagus. So my concern is to preserve the critical structures. But again here, no plane of cleavage whatsoever. Adhesions, vascular, etc. I think you got the message. So oh, we started like this. And I removed this tumor like this. I've saved her life. Her post-operative recovery was uneventful and some improvement in her neurological motor deficits. This is the patient afterwards, standing walking with facial nerve weakness. Histology. Dr. Hassan and Nabi. Actually, I asked Dr. Ibrahim if we could get the slides and photo them again, because that was that case was in 2000. At that time, there are so many differences from today. First of all, the quality of pictures of the cameras were very bad, and we could not take very good pictures. And I'm not sure that I took these pictures anyway. I told Dr. Ibrahim. Okay. So they're happening. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, actually I, we could see that there were two uh, pathologies and uh, one of them was a meningioma and the other was a uh, acoustic schwannoma. Uh, the other thing uh, in 2000 that uh, the criteria for uh, uh, um, uh, classifying meningiomas as to like uh, it is a classic meningioma or is it a type two meningioma were, or, or a grade two meningioma uh, was, were not very clear cut. So uh, with all this degree of necrosis that I saw later on, I would probably have to review the slides and maybe it was a grade two meningioma. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So this is a cellular. Okay, as you can see, it is quite cellular. Maybe there is a little bit of pleomorphism here. Again, this is definitely, you can see that these are quite pleomorphic, uh, but uh, alone by pleomorphism is not criteria for uh, malignancy. We have to see other things like the necrosis here. So this is probably, we'll put it in category uh, or grade two meningioma. Uh, this is whirling here and here it is hyalinized. Here it is cellular. I think this is, uh, I'm not sure this is EMA or 100. I, I cannot be sure because we, we should, we did, this slide is not labeled. But I think you know, here, uh, this is probably from uh, the second tumor. Yeah, from the first. The first? The first. Because, well, well, because there is a lot of, uh, like here you can see it is the hypocellular, uh, like we see in Chernobyl where you have hyper and hypocellular area, but anyway. It is all degenerative change. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay, let's talk, see here. This is an area where it is loose and here it is compact cells. And this is typical. And there is, you can see there is an arrangement of the nuclei in palisading fashion, which is also one of the features of schwannoma. Again, here you can see there is streaming of the cells, uh, spindly and cellular. Variability in uh, there are some mixoid areas which correspond to Antony type B. Uh, same thing, but uh, I'm not sure about this. Uh, this, is, this is an artifact, probably. Yeah, this is coterie artifact. Yeah, I, I think okay, it's difficult to remember slides from 20 years ago, and especially if not good, good quality. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, it is two pathologies, one on top of the other, at the site where the isotosis are. 
you cannot argue with this. We followed her up. The site of surgery is free. Followed her four years and look at this. New tumors are developing. At the mark of seven years, she was much worse. She was home uh, bound. She deteriorated progressively. And her family said, we will take nothing more. No radiation, no surgery, let her die. And she did. The second case is this uh, neurofibromatosis and this young 16 year old boy. The girl and the boy came in the same three months period. And you say they are rare. Two cases within three months. And he came with left abducen palsy, some exothalmus, had left sided weakness, he had deafness in his right ear, nothing in his family history. Uh, did you have any surgery before? Yes, I had surgery somewhere else. I'm not going to mention the name because it is disastrous. They had failed posterior fossa surgery. They went for a tumor, they went for the wrong side, and they have done nothing about it. So these are the images, bilateral stibular schonoma, cavernous sinus meningioma, audiometry again, showed sensory neural stiffness more on the right side. And this is the tumor of the foramen magnum. Look at this. The tumor is on this side, right side. They have to come to, from the left side. Now you don't only blame the resident if the resident has done it or the fellow, you blame the boss. If you are a boss and some of your guys does this, you and him should go to hell. This is not acceptable. And no explanation was given to the patient. You have done your surgery, go home. I showed you where they have opened on the left side. Tumor is just the same. And he was a quadriparitic. So I went in and did his foramen magnum. This is tend to be a schwannoma of the accessory nerve. Accessory nerve? Yes, accessory nerve. And here we are removing the tumor from these C2, C3 roots. And here's the spinal cord, internal oblongata, cerebellum, etc. Let's see the video. Sitting position, this is the right side, this is the left side, this is midline. This is the arachnoid, we are opening it. This is the tumor sitting on the back and on the right side of the spinal medullary junction. This here is the dentate ligament and C2, C3 roots that will form the spinal accessory nerve that will join the cranial accessory and form the accessory nerve. Again, the same principles, the bulking from within and then go around it and dissect it from the surrounding structures. Imagine people coming here, they did not find the tumor, they send the patient home without any explanation. Do I dare to mention the name of the hospital on this agent? I can, but I won't. Look here. It's a very critical situation. Yes, it is difficult. But if you can do the surgery, don't lie to people. Don't lie to patients and their families. Each and every nerve counts. I know surgeons who say, oh, who does need C2, C3? They cut it. Who does need spinal accessory? They cut it. Because they have no idea. So being patient, knowing that this patient is the only chance that you need to have. So you are doing here this, and also going and take it from the surface of the spinal medullary junction. Of course, here you have the pica, you have the vertebral, you can see it pulsating. You are taking the tumor off the spinal medullary junction. This is the cerebellum on the right side. This is microscopic surgery. There is no neurosurgery without microscope. Yet in Jordan, maybe, maybe 60, 70% of surgery is done without microscope. 
And the excuse is, oh, the people who use the microscope, they have fair vision, old people. They can't see, so they use the microscope. Yes. Or sometimes they put the finger and they just take the tumor out. With it, they can take the spinal cord out. So here you are, this is the cavity where the tumor was. This is the hyperglossal nerve, vertebral artery, etc. Okay. This is bus up, no tumor. This is where they went. This is where we went there, no tumor. We, we make a point of documenting this. We don't stand and speak about it. Histology, again by late Brahim Tilawi. I really miss the man, I, I used to respect him, I still respect him. Again, he said, this is a schwannoma. And because this man had left uh, abducing their policy, we gave him a knife for his cavernous sinus meningioma. And here it is, my name and his gamma knife plan. And this is the treatment plan. So I'm not accusing anybody, I've done the surgery, but I'm with all, with all convention presenting this to you so that you are convinced about what I'm saying. Volume was 7.2, 7.2 is a good sign. Now they're treating 18 and 20 and 30 uh, cubic centimeter. Yes. I more than three. Thank you. Three, three in diameter. This is the volume. Yeah, ah, yes. Exactly, Mahmoud. You were in the in the committee. Yes. When we started, we had committee. You were there. The endocrinologists were there. The oncologists were there. Neurologists, neurosurgeons. We used to sit and choose the cases. And then suddenly, no. It is one man show. And I don't accept that. So. We gave gamma knife, we followed them up. It's good, controlled, controlled, good. What do you mean by The same size. Not what I mean, what the... Uh, uh, the there is there any chance <laughs> that, that the no. no, no chance. No. Follow up six months, the same. Follow up 12 months, the same. This is the, 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 the message. Initially, you may say, oh, everything is good. Then we lost him four or five years. And he came back with increased intercranial pressure, failing bridge on the left side, weakness parameter on the right side. Look at this. Can you deny the same region that was treated with the gamma developing this tumor? Look at this. Can you tell at, this, at that time, that can be precise in so your, do not use the gamma knife for the patient. No, 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 no. All the papers saying you can. All the papers. So this is the tumor. So I went in, terrional approach, uh, Dunant's uh, approach, and this is the tumor sitting on the lateral aspect of the cavernous sinus. And this is the cavity afterwards. I think I'm gonna miss the video for the sake of time. And this is the histology. The histology surgery was done at the King Abdullah Hospital in Arbid, and it was reported by Hassan Tilfah and Sabah Nimri. I asked Dr. Farsaf to comment on this. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, if you allow me to mention uh, one interesting case before I go to the pathology of uh, 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 fiochromocytoma. Uh, 15 years ago, I encountered a case, a retiobertinian uh, tumor. I did CT-guided biopsy, and uh, after the biopsy, the patient had a very high spike of hypertension. Uh, it was at Arabi Medical Center. I didn't know why, but they told me, and then uh, the cardiologist uh, uh, treated here. Then when I saw the pathology, it was uh, surprisingly a few chromocytoma. Um, the case was referred to one of the big centers in Jordan. I talked to the surgeon. I told him what happened with me. I told him, you may lose this patient during operation. Please be careful. Uh, prepare the patient very well. Uh, the surgeon seems did not believe me or he was not really uh, one of the old surgeons did not take it serious. And, uh, and I heard that he operated in her and she died during surgery. 
So this is comes to uh, really uh, what is the dangers of fucomocytoma. Uh, medical school, we keep hammering fucomocytoma for the junior medical students, as despite its rarity, in order to prevent exactly the scenario from happening. How many medical students know about vanilla island delicacy and 24 hours? No, I, I used to know about medical, uh, medical schools before the deterioration. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, <coughs> it was a long time ago. Uh, this is not my case, so I only depends on the case. Uh, you can see this is really a very uh, small cell tumors most of the time. Uh, we call this is small cell component. And it is really she sheathless. I mean, there is no pattern of the tumor. Uh, and probably this is the dura. You can see again, here's a tumor uh, with uh, some uh, very cellular, uh, probably there's a very much marked atibia here. You can see the atibia, you cannot tell exactly whether this is carcinoma, sarcoma, uh, there's mitotic figures. Uh, and this is the definition of anaplastic meningioma. Uh, anaplastic meningioma, there are sheathless patterns. There's no button of the uh, uh, tumor. And you can you cannot tell whether this is carcinoma or sarcoma. And there's many mitotic figures. Some of them they say more than twenty. And uh, if you see this, uh, this is what there's. Uh, you can see the tumor, very bad tumors. If I see this, probably I will call it in the frozen section carcinoma. Uh, and it is mimic carcinoma. I think we have some, uh, some case uh, recently about this. Uh, you can see that the small cell components is very com common in these tumors. Uh, again, uh, but there are some uh, vascular dilatation and vascularity increased. And this is very big sheath of uh, undifferentiated tumor cells. Uh, again, uh, they said mentioned the report that there is brain invasion. Uh, this uh, again is, is, is one cell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Invasion. But, and I did not see brain, uh, glare tissue. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, this is glare tissue. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe. maybe. Yeah, it looks like embedding to it. So this was called anaplastic uh, meningioma. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Okay. So, yes, please. So, um, sorry. Um, there's really nothing surprising about what we're discussing here. Um, radiotherapy is known to cause malignancies. Chemotherapy is known to cause malignancies. The risk after radiotherapy increases with time. And the increase is exponential after a certain infection point, which differs between depending upon the type of radiotherapy and the original tumor. So even as something as distant as this as Hodgkin lymphoma and the mediastinum, 13 years after the end of radiotherapy and chemotherapy, patients' chance of death of other causes exceed that of the original malignancy. Now, Neurofibromatosis 2 are prone to developing tumors to start with, to developing brain tumors to start with. There is really nothing surprising in this. The only modality that is not teratogenic in, in our armamentarium is surgery. Chemotherapy is teratogenic, radiotherapy is teratogenic. It's, it's, I, I find it surprising that people still don't buy into this until this moment of time. And what Professor Spey has mentioned, well, the, the, this, the, the, that we're going to be flooded with cases on the future. Oh yes, absolutely. Because of this exponential increase in the incidence after radiotherapy, and there is really no tail into this. It's just exponential and keeps increasing at exponential rate. So if you look for them, You'll find them. May I, may I ask you a question to the product before you leave? Uh, what do you think about uh, using the cooking therapy or other things that we, uh, first of all, in the book, facts of one in case of neurofibromatosis? Some say that with a vaccine, the tumor sometime will disappear. What do you think about this? The vasodilatory and antigenic therapy does not cure any brain tumor. Okay. Its role, it the the we use it in in certain situations like in form of etc. Uh, 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 with muscle tumors, uh, we use it in a palliative uh, 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 manner in uh, in um, in gliomas and high grade gliomas. But let me emphasize, bevacizumab and anti antigenic therapy does not cure anything. Okay. Sure. Is there any risk or benefits to use it as a new adjuvant before surgery in case of 
larger tumor. Mahmoud, like don't talk about one or two papers. You asked no, me this really. question before. What no, I'm I asking. Ask you. It's still experimental. I have experience in yes, this because it is in my field. You know the answer. It is useless. Yeah. Don't keep asking so the same the, questions. So the, the new adjuvant, it really doesn't really matter. It doesn't cure anybody. And if you can't operate, then, then it's radio and, and, and chemo, biological, etc. Well, I'm not talking about one or two papers. We are talking about the current practice in medicine. Yes. And if I don't know what is the current practice of medicine treatment of meningiomas and stimulationoma, then I'm done. I'm a skull-based surgeon. I should know all this. I'm following all the papers. Yes, okay. I know okay. post op MRI, we have removed the tumor in a good fashion. But of course, you can't expect to have removed it completely. Uh, post op showed some recovery in his weakness. His left abusing did not recover. We referred him for radiotherapy because what else can we do? But this was declined by the patient and his family. Enough is enough. Seven years later, flare up of the tumor again. He died at home. This is the natural history of neurofibromatosis. So, coming to conclusions, and I'm happy that today we've uh, almost done it in one hour. We should be able, again, the same question is asked to me. Do you refer patients for the therapy? Of course. Do you refer patients for gamma knife? Of course. When it is indicated. I am a skull based surgeon. I am referring patients for gamma knife when it is indicated. Not because I'm referring them because I don't know how to do the surgery, because I am a mediocre surgeon. This is what I'm against. Mediocre surgeons taking this tool to cover their ineffectiveness. So let's be honest about it. We should be able to see and foresee long-term problems. The tumors after radiation comes after 20 and 30 years. Mark Belsky, I mentioned that the other day, the potential risk of radio surgery is real. It is not fictional. It has become a major concern among health professionals and the public. Don't put your head under the sand, face it. All patients, now this is realized by Pittsburgh, all patients receiving radio surgery should be informed about the risk of radiation induced tumors. This is the one, this is the second center in the world using the gamma knife. The first of course is Karolinska, this is the second. They say, we have to tell your patient there is the risk of malignancy or tumor induction, it is real. The risk of malignancy following radio surgery cannot be ignored, especially that more than 1 million cases have been treated. 1 million patients have been treated with gamma knife. But look at this, between 2010, 2019, 700,000. These, we don't know anything about them. And once they come back, this is gonna be something. So many reports are showing the new tumors or malignant transformation after gamma nine for the delayed period. So we need to have a long-term follow. Don't even mention the papers of the three or five or seven years from now. You need longer period of time. And I want to challenge, and I challenged last time, the uh, Kahan criteria. I will not buy five years period anymore. There is a good bulk of evidence. And radio surgery is different from radiotherapy. But the number of reported cases already increasing, as you have seen, we expect to see further major increase in the future. This is not a pump in the road. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Thank you very much. Okay. Any question or comment, please? Aoshi, thank you very much for interesting. Every time I come here, that is more and more interesting. Now I want to ask you, besides the surgery and besides the complications of radiotherapy and surgery, as a pediatrician for the past uh, five decades, we see neurofibromatosis a lot. We see uh, patients that have more than six, and this will scare the hell of my patients. Just last week, I had to take uh, send the mother to a psychiatrist because she was worried. What is the best to a follow-up for this. Uh, and you, you are now in a class of pediatrician. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in FF2 and F1 or NF2, 
you don't operate or give radiation or chemotherapy unless it is absolutely necessary. So observation is the main treatment. Unless it is causing something disastrous, then you would start with the treatment. But the family, they know deep in their heart that with the age, they are gonna lose their child. And they have to prepare them for this. I remember an Iraqi boy came, I've showed some of these pictures. And I told the father, oh, okay, I'm gonna operate on this tumor, but your child is gonna have another tumor, another tumor, and he's gonna die. He broke down uh, crying, but he realized this is the truth. And he took his child and left him. Any questions coming? Oh, for, as usual, for the residents. And if two, miss me, okay? Multiple intracranial ischwanomas, meningioma, even, even dimoma. This is how you remember. So what you are missing? In F2, no. you are missing neurofibromas. No, no neurofibromas, yeah? So in F2, no in neurofibromas, yeah? What is other things multiple inside the brain? Calcification, yes? Cerebellar and supratentorial. You have multiple opacities on the eye, yes? It is a character through, posterior to the lens. What others? Meningio, meningio angiomatosis, multiple lesions, and glial microhematomas. These are the multiple lesions which you see in an F2 in the intracranial. Thank you. Any question, comment? Please. Thank you, Dr. Rahim. In case of bilateral vestibular masses, if you said that the 100 percent is neurofibromatosis type 2, but we have to consider also uh, sarcoids and metastasis. Of course. Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, with anything bilateral, you have to exclude the non common ones. The common one is the uh, yes. neurofibromatosis. Yes, 100 percent. I think uh, he left uh, a lot. I sent him a case recently with bilateral bit of vitroclavial meningiomas, and I said, could this be a sarcoidosis? And so on. So one need to be careful, of course. Doctor. So from all this, what's the actual incidence if you have a hundred, if you have a thousand patients with uh, gamma 90, what's the percentage? One percent, one in a thousand, one in a hundred thousand, or you don't know? So far, no, so far it is the same like radiotherapy and radiotherapy incidence is one to three percent. One to three percent of cases receive radiotherapy, same in radio surgery can develop tumors. But I'm telling you, we still will see more, and we can jump up to 11, 15 percent. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, uh, I have seen uh, a patient with uh, multiple metastatic lesions in the brain, uh, at least at least 15 lesions. Uh, and uh, he uh, he was under he underwent uh, uh, gamma knife uh, treatment. So is it useful really? Uh, this is my question. The second question is the role of uh, gamma knife in uh, Parkinson disease. Is there any uh, indication for uh, or any uh, use? Is it useful for Parkinson? So. What is the value of uh, common knife in Parkinson's disease and metastasis? Uh, second one in Parkinson is useless. Useless. Why? Because with Parkinson's, you need to have dynamic testing. You will put your probe and push it or pull it until you get the desire. This is not with gamma because the gamma have decided the target and you hit it. So it's no more used. Some people are still doing it in spite of all the precautions. Uh, for metastasis, it started with giving one metastasis, then they took it to three metastases, then they took it to five metastases. Recent publications from, from Japan treating 77 zero metastases. How much that would cost for the patient? And what is useful? Is it it's just like radiotherapy? So the whole concept of gamma has been changed by these mediocre people. These I'm against. I'm not against. The principle of gamma, it's beautiful, it's a good tool. But to treat 70 or 10 metastases or seven cubic seven diameter tumors, 
Yeah. This is insane. So, sir, please. So, what is the message? If the tumor is too too much large and causing compressive symptoms, no gamma knife surgery. Is yes. yes. And if the, the tumor is small, what to do? Observation you and don't give gamma no, knife. No. As you said last time. Uh, with large tumors, it is definitely surgery. Right. With the tumors three centimeters or less, you have the two options. You have the three options, observation, gamma knife, surgery. Be honest and tell the patient what that entails. What's your tell them, I tell them exactly this. If it is a vestibular schwannoma, I say the risk of, there are all those people are concerned about the facial nerve, yes. especially females. You say facial nerve damage in gamma knife yes. is five to nine percent. In surgery, it was up to 50. So immediately they said, Gamma knife is good. Uh, gamma knife, no anesthesia, no incision. Surgery, there is. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm going to go for radio surgery. And then you tell them the important thing Gamma knife can keep the patient, keep the tumor that is, or smaller. But 30%, it can grow in size in spite of the radiation. Then you will need surgery. And then say that your surgery is 100 times different. If they choose gamma after all this, it's the, but it is by law that you tell the patient all the options and get them to sight. Any questions? Yes. About the impact on survival, you mentioned before that the survival is about one third, six years. So after introduction of gamma knife in the last 20 years, how much that, how much gamma knife that? Improved? Nothing. No surgery or gamma knife for the NF2 patients change their uh, life. So just improve the quality. Of exactly. Absolutely. 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 Right. If there's no more question, we'll see you next week. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, Dr. Sabeo. Yes, we have some comments and questions. Very good. Well, how are you doing, Khalif? Yeah. Let's get the young man on camera. Yeah. Yes, yes. So let me let me remark. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Yes, I talked to the tech. He said he's coming on. All right. Okay. Very good lecture. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's been doing these for years. Yeah. Greetings, Dr. Sabaya. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you again, and thank you for an excellent presentation. You've been doing these for 27 years, a multidisciplinary presentation. Let me just turn it over immediately. I believe Khalif has a question. Khalif from Kenya. Hello, Khalif. Sure. Yeah, assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. I Yeah, thank you so much. I think you've driven this message home that do not radiate patients with uh, benign uh, tumors. Try as much as possible to get maximum safe resection. I think that message is gone home very well. What we've seen is patients who come with low-grade gliomas, some of them not completely resectable, and then you send them to, to radiation, and then after one, two years, they come back. The tumor has changed now, GBM, life quality has changed and everything is down the drain. So these radiations, gamma knife and all these things, they change the genetic alterations. Which options do we have as neurosurgeons to treat these patients? Is it safe to say that, you know what, you have, you have a low-grade glioma or a ependymoma, let's just keep resecting every time it comes back instead of sending you to, to radiation or, or right. gamma knife? Sure, sure. Uh, in principle, whether you are dealing with low-grade glioma or middle-grade or high-grade, and I disagree with these classifications, I believe yes. low-grade glioma exists in a very small percentage of patients, especially young age. 
But after that, you have grade two and grade three and grade four. Glioma, by definition, is malignant tumor, or at least it is not benign, simply. Okay. So there is no edge for it. You don't see the edge of the tumor. And gamma knife was made for benign lesions with a definite edge for it. Yes. It is, it is like there is a voice uh, coming in. Someone. Some, some, some interference. Anyway, uh, the 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 uh, the the contour of the, the lesion that you are treating with them should be defined. I always tell my patients, your tumor, if it is benign, it's just like an apple in a sack of something soft. So you can put your hand and take the apple from the sack. Right? Sand, say, okay. Sack of sand, soft sand. Well, malignant okay. tumors is like a, you have kind of a fist of rice and put it in this sand. You just cannot take it out. There's no itch for it. So how can you treat it with radiation, with, with, the, with the radiosurgery? It has to be radiated. So people are treating diamonds with gamma knife. And this is not good because there is no edge. They are saying we are treating the growing edge. So they decide that so the medial side is the growing edge. How would you know that the medial side of the tumor is the growing edge? So they are using this terminology to cover up their inadequacies. We have to be scientific about it. There is no edge for the tumor and we don't know where they grow from. So I give them radiotherapy. But before that, maximum yes. resection. I am a member of the Oncology Committee of the World Federation, and there are recommendations for this. If you don't remove 85% to 90% of the tumor, then radiotherapy, subsequent radiotherapy and chemotherapy is gonna be useless. If you remove 20% and central radiotherapy is useless. Remove 85 to 90% and central radiotherapy, it's useful. So many concepts are there. They are doctrined. Everybody recognizes them if they read, but people don't want to read, they don't want to listen, they just want to continue with this inhumane practice of doing simple biopsy and sending for radiotherapy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So the era of biopsy and then sending the patient for radiation is- This is, this is a crime. This is a crime, simple. All right. Very good. Adnan, do you have a comment or question for Dr. Sabaya? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to ask something. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, just a wonderful presentation once again. Uh, last time when I uh, first uh, learned by this radiation induced tumors, it was first time in, because I'm in early start of my career as a neurosurgeon because still I have just three years uh, I have started my residency. And then I went to and searched uh, about topics, some topics about uh, radiation induced uh, tumors which I found uh, was the double trouble, a tale of two radiation uh, treatment. It was published in 2014 uh, from some country, I think uh, some uh, department of neurosurgery in UK. Very good article. Uh, today, I, what I learned from your presentation is uh, there are a lot of messages, but one is that you have been trained for uh, just uh, in the hospital you mentioned, I forgot the name. Clarence, you said that, Clarence came in yeah, Stockholm. Yeah, just, you told that in just one week you have learned about gamma knife surgery. The rest of six months, it was about the patient selection. Absolutely. Which is very important. Which is yeah. as much more important than the, than the one week of training. In one week, you can this pushing a button. It's nothing. Exactly. Putting the frame exactly. is nothing. Within one week, you can learn the trick. It is when to choose the patient and then to see the yeah. follow-up. We have, they have gone for gamma knife 10 years ago, they're coming back for follow-up. So you know, how did they differentiate the sarcoidosis from bitterclibal meningiomas? Exactly. So six exactly. months of seeing the thing correctly. And when I went back to Jordan, I made my committee of 20 people, oncologists, radiation oncologists, endocrinologists, you name it, yeah. neurosurgeons, so, neurologists, so that we sit and choose. And when we face a single the gamma person knife, cannot decide the who a single person can never decide. If absolutely. Decide, when when we started uh, as the first um, Middle East uh, gamma knife, we were number thirteen in the world. We had the influx of cases coming from all over the Arab countries. We used to have 30, 40 cases per week. So we can sit and to choose one or two out of them. We were not after money. We were after correct use of this beautiful tool 
gamma is a beautiful tool, but it has to be used properly and not to be left in the hands of mediocre surgeons. Exactly. Another thing you have pointed out in that in last uh, uh, nine years, from 2010 to 2019, it has been given 700,000 yes. cases of uh, uh, radio surgery. And uh, one question is, when we will see at the average approximate time that uh, that tsunami of that case is coming with recurrence nine, or another the new... Yeah, sure. case, uh, the new, accepted time uh, in, uh, in average is 19 years. So if you say yes. you have treated the patient from now 2010, on. so you have to wait mm. till 2030 to see the effect. That's why I'm 30. saying, yeah, that's why I'm saying it is the tip of the iceberg. So uh, one another question I am uh, asking for, uh, what should be the approach? Do you think that uh, if we encounter that patient with the recurrence or a new uh, tumor formation, what we should uh, decide you know, what to there should be another uh, plan or approach to deal with that patient because we have mentioned that uh, uh, initially if you have we treat them with radiation it changes the uh, consistency even we cannot uh, differentiate with the, uh, in between uh, sure. normal tissue and the tumor tissue like in brainstem you are mentioning so it will be a double trouble as well uh, in that case it is the dilemma of these cases, but the, the principle is the same. If you can operate and give them a chance, go ahead and follow that with radiotherapy, because this is the only option. Now. Sometimes you use option because you are losing. So you accept the second and third and fourth choice and uh, proceed with it because you are sick, facing with a difficult situation. No, very, very thankful to you, Thank you very and much. every participant over here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Sebeyak, thank you very much. What is the topic next week? I was thinking of uh, putting a case of uh, aneurysmal bone cysts of the skull base and the orbit. Okay, we look forward to seeing that. And we'd like to remind the internet audience that all these presentations from the past 27 weeks are on the Jordan channel of Neurosurgical TV. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the panelists for coming out. And we'll see you next week, thank Dr. You so Pleasure. Thank you very thank much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Exactly. Okay, very good. It's a wrap. <laughs> it's great, man. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Hey, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll, we'll get better at this. We'll get better at this. Uh, um, and that and that was on the app. Hopefully, we'll get the app fixed so that, boom, you see it right on the front page of your smartphone. Yeah, yep. it was very good. So, thank so you, you. Thank you, Dr. John Bennett. Hey, yeah, any, any progress on the cadaver lab at all? No, man, I haven't found okay. time to go there. Man. Okay, no I, problem. I really hey, you know, if you there. give me his contact info, I'll do it because you're busy. Yeah. Give me okay. his contact me... info and I'll, I'll chase him. All right, all right, all right. Uh, uh, the Spain, the from, man from Spain, what was his name? I'm you're sorry. Asking, you're asking, you're saying that about that man, uh, your friend, I forgot his name, who have, who was dealing that case of 3D anatomy, NED, and this. All right. What was his name, Dr. Khalid? Hello? I think he is. I believe, I believe uh, Dr. Khalif is trying to set up a cadaver lab. Uh, see, he told me about uh, a, a doctor's name, uh, one from Spain, who has uh, different uh, cases about, uh, who has different uh, programs about cadaveric lab or 3D anatomy, neuroanatomy. And, yeah, uh, well, we're, we're open to televise anything that yeah, has I relevance have, to neurosurgery. Him. Yeah, I have emailed him. He told me that he has, uh, he know about neurosurgery TV and once he gets some time and he will offer his services. As oh, well. now, now, which neurosurgeon is this? What's the name? Uh, let me, let is me that me Pablo, me. Pablo Gonzalez? Yeah, yeah, it's the same, the same guy. No, I he talked mean, to, I was in Spain last week and I talked to Pablo. I had sent him mail and he responded to me that he knows you and he knows the uh, neurosurgical TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if it's the same, uh, yeah, Dr. Pablo Gonzalez, he's from Barcelona, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, guy. yeah. I'm he, going to be visiting Dr. Pablo Gonzalez in, in January next year. So 
yeah, and I'll great. be using his lab. Yeah, and by that time I'll also be trying to do the dissections on in his lab and, and we'll televise it. Right. Hopefully. Well, yeah, we're trying to, uh, like I talked to him last week in Spain I, I, on okay. Facebook. Uh, he yeah. was at the airport and, I, and he was good enough to take the call, but uh, we're going to try to have further discussions on putting 3D anatomy online yeah. because yeah, he yeah. goes to Tanzania, like, as you know, now. He already yeah, I've met him several times there. I've, I've met oh, him okay. several times there. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you know exactly. I, you know, I've never seen 3D neuroanatomy. I, I'm interested. It is in awesome. It. it is awesome. Well, we'd love to put it online. And you know what, Khalif? He said he's interested. Yes, sir. So, you know, he's he wants interested? to explore. Yes, he said he's interested. Uh, that's that's very good. So that's a good sign. Him. When someone says that, yeah. that means uh, they're listening. <laughs> wow, that's great. <clears throat> so that, that there are a lot of people were interested in this. This is a it's a great project, John. You 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 did for us. For the well, I, I love it. I love it. It's uh, you, yeah. you know it, it revitalizes me. It's my really my best time in medicine, Khalif. You know your your okay. days are ahead of you. Uh, <laughs> But mine, mine are pretty well over. So and you as I found John, something so, yes. I can do that makes me feel good about medicine yeah. again, you know? Yeah, you know, some, one, one guy once asked me, and, you know, like, he asked me what is, what is his, um, what, is, uh, what is Dr. John's motivation? Like, you know, how come he's televising um, neurosurgery events around the globe? Because there was a time that you are televising Kenya, and then there was something happening in South America, probably 24 hour difference. And, and, and you are there seated, you know, bringing uh, those lectures to wider audience. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. You have to have. Well, the internet makes it easier. <laughs> I mean, the, yes. the, the tools are there. We just got to use them. We just got to find the them and use, and use them. It, so, what if it's 3 a.m. for you and it's 9 a.m. for. No, no. 3 p.m. for China. It does, it does get a little weird. Like now, exactly. uh, yes. tomorrow, Thursday, listen to this. Tomorrow, we're televising yes. from Ecuador in the day okay. and from India at night. So <laughs> I, I, it's going to be like a back in medicine again. So you, you see know? now your own call. Yeah, three days in a row, man. I, I got to <laughs> get some, you know, a couple hours sleep here and there. Uh, but, yeah. No, it, it's it's great. I mean, the South American one. I'm really, I really looking forward to doing that. Uh, on Parkinson's, it is uh, Spanish. Parkinson. Yeah, it's in okay. Spanish. Well, part of it's in English, and part most okay. of it's in Spanish. And then we're doing one on uh, micro micro surgery from India, from Chennai. From India. We're, we're, yeah, okay. we're broadcasting. Uh, uh, it's it's a workshop, a micro surgery okay. workshop by. By Atel Goel. Goel is one of the main the main presenters. Do you know Atel a tool to Goel? He's he's a big uh, uh, Indian neurosurgeon. Him, yeah. You probably heard of yeah. him. A tool Goel. G O E L. Yeah. Uh, he, he, I can't tell you what area of neurosurgery his fame lies, but yeah. I know he's big. I know he gets a lot of interest. But anyways, that's uh, t t tomorrow night. Or tomorrow day. Tomorrow in, night. In India. Uh, for you, it would be early morning. It'd be like 9 o'clock in India. So what time in Kenya? That's probably like, what, 6.30? No, we, there's a difference, like three hours. So it's 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. or 9 a.m.? 9 p.m. 9 a.m. In the morning. In the morning, yeah. 9 a.m. in the morning. So yeah, on yeah. our side, it's going to be like 6 a.m. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. yeah and you will be around 9 p.m., right? Yeah, uh, yeah. 12, no, 11, it's nine and a half hours 11. difference. 11.30, actually. 11.30. In Pakistan, yeah. to be 11. No, yeah. nine, nine and a uh, half. Just yeah. half of our distance. Uh, half of our distance from India. We are, just, we are neighbors, but not good neighbors. Okay, very good. Uh, John, one question. You can, can you share me that uh, uh, live streaming link or that Zoom uh, ID? For Ecuador presentation, Ecuador and that, that of Chennai, when you will uh, live telecast that. You know, I have a really hard part. time understanding what you're saying. Oh, uh, my ear is uh, not. I, yeah, yeah. I have asked that, uh, can you share me that uh, meeting ID or uh, that uh, broadcasting uh, link 
to join that uh, of uh, conference of uh, Ecuador in Spanish. Yeah, and yeah, then... of course. You're on the mailing list, right? I sent it to everybody. Oh, I have not received. I'm, I'm somehow not in your mailing list as well, oh, Mr. John. Yeah, oh, I'm not oh, in your mailing list. Okay, you guys, give me your email address in the chat yeah, box. I'll I, put I, it on I'm right now. Put it in the yeah. chat box. I'll put your both yeah. emails because usually I broadcast it to all the mailing lists. Boom, boom, yeah. with the link. So, you know, yeah. they all have the link, so you don't have to run around and look for it. John, please check. I have sent you. Yeah, I see. I uh, okay, there you I go. Okay. Somebody else. But I know it is mine. Party. Yeah, could so you? I, I think I probably you. have yours, but just in case, give it to me. Okay, yeah, now I got yours. Uh, okay. Oh, Dr. Patel. Okay, Dr. Patel. I don't think I have his. Uh, there's Khalif. Yeah. Got it. So mine is uh, f-a-t-a-h fatahnur at gmail.com. Okay. Yeah, love your background there. Okay. You, do you got my email? Yeah, yeah. You have a good background too there, uh, Nan. You know, that's, yeah. that's good. That's good. It's yeah. like part advertising, part image, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was the last year conference at SARC, uh, South Asian Association of Regional Corporation. Well, I don't know if we we televised a few from Pakistan, well, a couple of spinal ones from Dr. Salman uh, mm -hmm. Sharif. And Dr. Anila. Yeah. Yeah. And Anita. Anila. 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 Anita. Anila. Anita. Anita. Anila. Anita. Anila. Yes. Broadcasting for her the first week of, of uh, October. And we're going to be broadcasting from Russia, from Alfred okay. Sufyanov, uh, probably mid October. Uh, I think from it's. From Russia? Yeah, yeah, Tiamat. Mid October. Yeah, yeah, from Tiamat. Who's from who? Albert well, I I introduced me to Albert Sufinov. He's a big Russian. Oh, Sufinov is a big guy. He's in Serbia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Siberia. Si yeah, yeah. Well, when you say Siberia, it's you think of, but it's South Siberia <laughs> near China. It's not. Yeah. You know, it's not really yeah. Siberia, but it's they call it Siberia. It's Tiamat, a city called Tiamat. But I'm sure it gets yeah. cold as hell there. Colder than I want yeah, to so, go to. Uh, John, I'm going to send you the the yeah, email of him. that. Yeah, let me send you the email. Yes, you know it's yeah. key that I get a I yeah. get a good video chat with him. Get you know get yeah. to know yeah. get to know him. You know. Yes, yes, yes. It's a lady. Well, okay, Grace. that would be great. I would love to, you know, yeah. get to know her and then maybe, you know, try some things and not bother you for every little thing I have. That is that is our email link I've sent you. Okay, well, where where is that? The Fatu Noor? No, no, that's mine. That's yours. Where, where, let's see. Oh, the last one. Okay, Grace. Yes, yes. Did you add mine into your li mailing list? Yeah. Yeah, I did. All right. Let All me right. get Grace's here. That's her first name, Grace, right? Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, very good. Okay, I got to go to the Ecuador conference uh, now. I, I got to set it up for tomorrow. Okay. And please share me that uh, web link for that conference. <laughs> for the... Um, Ecuador. Oh, of course. I'm going to put you in the mailing list and you'll get it okay, automatically. Thanks. You'll get it automatically. Okay. Thanks a lot, John. Okay. Thanks for that excellent uh, yeah. forum for, uh, for us. Hey, you see, uh, do you uh, you understand Spanish? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, ¿Cómo conoce español? ¿Tú fuiste allá para sí, yo estuve, sí, yo estuve en Cuba. Oh, Cuba. Wow. ¿Cuánto sí. tiempo? Siete años. Oh, my God. Por Dios. Mucho tiempo. Sí. Tú eres parte cubano. Sí, sí, claro. 
Sí, tú puedes puede participar en los congresos. Claro, Tenemos, claro. Hace poco tiempo uh, televisamos tres congresos de neurocirugía pediátrica. Ah, desde ¿de Quito, qué país? Ciudad de México, ah, Perú. Y, uh, ah. y sí, televisamos de, algunos de Perú, pero uh, uh -huh. quiero, quiero establecer canales en Latinoamérica. Sí, uh, lo... Lo estuve en la conferencia de eh, Luis Borba, lo que apareció hace dos, tres semanas antes. Sí, sí, él, él le gusta sí. esta plataforma. Él dice que sí, cualquier sí. tiempo que necesite un sí, presentador, muy, dígame. Muy, no, sí. él, él conoce media social, él sigue. Sí, sí. Él es y, él, y sí, en él está en la lista también. Él recibe cada charla cada, para entrar si él quiere. Ok, hoy, hoy voy a recibir también. Yo Ya usted tiene mi dirección de correo en la lista. Para ok, yo voy a poner la... ahorita. Ok, Adnan, tengo que ir. Ok, muchas gracias. Ok, hasta Chao. la próxima. Hasta la próxima. Chao.